A few months ago, I decided to do a question and answer episode, just kind of testing out the format and responding to a lot of questions that had been left on my videos. And I said, you know, if anyone had any questions, I would do an episode too. We'll see how it goes. Well, uh, one viewer had a ton of questions, and I want to answer all of them here on uh, episode two, as it were. His name is Swoosh, or her name, I'm not sure, is uh, Swoosh C. And I uh, believe uh, he or she has a YouTube video or a YouTube channel um, coming up pretty soon. So uh, you can check that out. Uh, this person asked a ton of fascinating questions, and I want to get right into them. So the first question that they asked was, what is my favorite game system of all time and why? And I think I would have to go with the Super Nintendo slash Super Famicom. Uh, I went into why uh, pretty extensively on my SNES versus Genesis video, but the reason, you know, for me, it has to do with I think the nostalgia for the video game wars, and I grew up during that time, and that battle between Sega and Nintendo was so central for me. Uh, I grew up with a Nintendo, uh, I got a TurboGrafx-16 and a Sega, and as wonderful as those consoles were, I always wanted the Super Nintendo, and I only got it very, very, very late in its life cycle. I want to say 95 and 96. So at that point, I was able to get, like, from Blockbuster and the, and the discount bins, tons of the best SNES games. And this was an incredible system. And it was a system that I had dreamt about for so long. You know, because I just, as a kid, you know, you can't really get uh, a lot of systems, uh, at least when you want them. So, you know, games like Donkey Kong Country, uh, the Final Fantasy games, Secret of Mana, Chrono Trigger, all these games that... I had read about that I followed in the EGMs, and then finally to get them and play them, and they lived up, as a kid anyway, to the fantasies I had about them. It was just a wonderful time. And then as I got into importing, collecting, uh, emulating, and I discovered the wonderful Super Famicom library. I mean, this was a system that had just so many, if you combine uh, both libraries, just so many amazing titles. Uh, games like Umehare Kawase, um, I think they had one of the Hammering Hero games on there, all the cool uh, Japanese pro wrestling games, and all the stuff that has been translated now, you know, that you can get with emulation. I can't even think of all of the crazy, uh, you know, library of RPGs like Bahamut Lagoon and uh, Longrisser. Um, so uh, just a, a wonderful, wonderful system, and it still stands up there today. Uh, as just an incredible experience discovering all that it had to offer. Uh, the next question is, what would I do if I obtained a copy of Stadium Events? Would I sell it to buy more games I want to play, or have it and keep it for collector's reasons, or play it? And I would say my answer is none of the above. If I obtained a copy of Stadium Events, and here I'm assuming that I get it for an incredibly low price, or I just find it somewhere, you know, I, I get it for no uh, outlay of cash or a minimal outlay of cash. What would I do with it? Um, I would sell it, but I wouldn't buy more games. Let's say I could get uh, $50,000, uh, and then after, you know, seller fees and taxes and all that, let's say I walk away with uh, $42,000. $42, uh, I would take that money, and I would invest it and not spend a dime, not use it to buy more video games. I would essentially put it towards my retirement. It would be a windfall, and in life you don't get too many windfalls if you're just sort of an average person anyway. So uh, I think uh, the rationalist within me would do that with stadium events. Uh, so the next question is, if I blew up into a bigger YouTube channel and I were able to make money doing it, would I do it more, and why? An interesting question uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, I don't think I will ever blow up into a big YouTube channel. I think the kind of stuff, the, the videos that I produce are no longer in fashion, if they ever were here on YouTube. No one, no one really uh, gravitates towards uh, thoughtful, critical commentary. YouTube has essentially become 
a collection of commercials and guerrilla advertising, but um, would I continue doing it if I were making more money? I think, you know, it would have to be, well, you know, how much money am I making? Um, I do make some money off of the channel, and it doesn't have any sort of impact on my life, nor does it make me want to change the way I do things. I think probably I would continue making the sort of stuff that I'm making. And if I could make money doing it, great. Um, I think I've put out quite a few videos. You know, I think I have over 300 videos uh, at this point, which have generated uh, 2,200 subscribers, which is, I mean, sad in a lot of ways. But I don't think I would do uh, necessarily any more. Again, I mean, if we're talking about, like, I put out a video and it gets uh, 2 million views, and I don't know how much money that makes you on YouTube, a thousand bucks, will I consider upping my productivity? I mean, I guess with those numbers, yes. But, you know, if we're talking getting 10, 20,000 subscribers and making a couple hundred bucks a year, I, I don't think it would change exactly uh, what I do on here, nor would I want to, you know, I've always said that I'm uh, completely independent. I would never uh, do the kind of unboxings and clandestine ad campaigns that a lot of channels do. So I, I don't think uh, that would ever come into the picture. What is my opinion on clone consoles, uh, like the Retron 1 through 5, and other ones like the Classic 2, which I've never heard of? Um, no problem with them. I think if they're well made and they work, you know, I have a Retron 5, and I generally liked it. I thought it did breathe some life into my classic game collection, in the sense that, you know, I didn't need to hook up all, all the systems. I had it all there. I mean, it was a little tough to get the carts in and out of there, but uh, yeah, I don't have a problem with them at all. Uh, I'd like to see a new wave of clone consoles doing Sega Saturn, PlayStation, and N64. I think that's probably a pipe dream at this point, but I think... You know, if they came out with, if they were able to get uh, sort of disc-based uh, clone consoles going, um, I would be a fan of those, and I would pick those up. Next question is a big one. Um, what do I think could help the retro gaming market and economy? And how can we form a better, non-toxic, and mature community for everyone to enjoy? That is a loaded question. I think, um, you know, as far as the gaming market and economy. I've said on a few occasions, I think, you know, video game collecting could take two paths. And I've always compared it to baseball card collecting in the 90s and coin collecting. And I said baseball card collecting in the 90s was an example of an immature market where people were just throwing money left and right at these cards. Prices skyrocketed. And basically that all came to an end in 2008 with the market crash. And I've uh, you know, the general uh, economic crash, people didn't have so much expendable income, and the prices of baseball cards have kind of, uh, you know, gotten back to a normal, rational level, where something like a Mickey Mantle will still command extreme money, but the Ken Griffey Jr., you know, parallel refractor thing that might have sold for 400 bucks in the late 90s, you know, is is a $20 card. So uh, I think we're heading in that direction. And I said, you know, a mature market would be something like coin collecting, where coin collecting has, uh, you know, a very, very established marketplace. It has established price guides, and no one questions them. And those price guides are tied uh, to, to rarity and, of course, uh, the sort of raw material value of a lot of these coins, which obviously games don't have. But it, I think what would be healthy is to say, you know, to say to the market, look, something like Mega Man 2, you know, which goes for a lot of money, or uh, Super Mario 3, something which had millions and millions of copies, you know, these should not be $40, $50 games. In the case of Mario 3, I know Mega Man 2 is, is probably higher than that at this point. So to just give people an idea of the rarity of these games, to track the sales in a comprehensive and accurate way. I know price charting is trying to do that. It has a lot of problems. Um, I think that would be a step in, in the right direction to kind of quell the, I don't know what you would, what you would want to call it, the, the hype machine that I think YouTube 
has created. But I, I don't believe in, you know, I think markets should just function as, as they do. I mean, there's sometimes people are going to uh, chase money and, and throw crazy money at things that aren't really valuable. But at least if you had a source for unbiased, accurate information, then I think it would regulate, it would help regulate the market in the sense that, you know, okay, I know Game X is popular, but there were 1.5 million copies of it, so I'm re I really shouldn't pay you know X amount for this game. Uh, I think that would help. Now, as far as toxicity and maturity of the gaming community, you know this is kind of a harder thing to pin down. I'll give you an example. I um, because everyone was talking about Fortnite, I downloaded Fortnite and I played Fortnite, and I, I really didn't know what I was doing, and I didn't know that, you know, when you play Fortnite in, in kind of the team setting, you know, people can talk to you and all of that. So as I was figuring out the controls, now granted, I had just read about it, I didn't watch any videos, I really had no idea what I was supposed to be doing. Um, and so people are saying, you know, I'm just trying to manage my inventory and figure out, you know, oh, there's the storm thing, I'm not supposed to run into it, I'm supposed to run away. And, you know, I got a lot of, oh, fucking faggot, what are you doing? Stand up, don't go there. You know, a lot of that kind of language uh, that is abusive. Now, I'm not someone with a thin skin, but I, I wonder if those days should be behind us now. That, that you know, we, we don't need the kind of homophobic uh, profanity, that sort of thing. I, I don't know exactly how... Uh, you would regulate that in a fair way, and I know Xbox uh, was trying to kick people off the service who were who were using that kind of language. So, um, but I mean that's not retro. I you know as far as retro goes, I I, I just uh, it's kind of interesting. I went I've only been to one convention and I didn't like it, and I sort of haven't so I don't have a read on how these big gatherings function. But, uh, yeah, I would, uh, I, I would hope that as people mature that they will kind of move away from the, the juvenile stuff and just enjoy the medium and the hobby for what it is. And the final question was physical or digital media. And this is an interesting one because I was thinking, you know, probably five years ago I would have said, oh, um, you know, physical, no question. But my position has uh, been modified for a couple of reasons. One, with... The advent of quality emulation, obviously, we've run into a situation where, you know, do I really need physical copies of Nintendo, Super Nintendo, uh, Sega Genesis games, you know, all of the 8-bit, 16-bit games, because I can play all of them with reasonable fidelity. Yes, the input lag might be there. Yes, it's not exactly, you know, 100% accurate emulation in many cases. But if I'm 95% of the way there with emulation or with compilations that I can get, I don't know, on the eShop or the PlayStation 4 and so forth, do I really need the physical media? And my answer to that has been no. And I've actually gone and I've sold... Um, a good chunk of my Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis collections. One, look, the market is high, so why hold on to them when I could play these games in other forms? Uh, and two, you know, you get to a point where space is an issue, and I'm slowly reaching that point. So I think those factors forced me to sell those games. The, the next point is... I think modern games, things like, take for example, Sea of Thieves, games that have a, that are so integrated with the internet and with servers managed by a company, that when these things, when these technologies get turned off, you essentially have no game. At that point, do you need a physical copy? What will you, what will you be able to do with the physical copy? If, when you put it in, it calls out to a server that doesn't exist. So, I think for those titles, physical is no better 
than the digital format. Um, and I think also with things like Xbox uh, Game Pass, I think it's called, or uh, EA Access, you uh, you have a model where I don't know that you need a physical game. If I could pay 120 bucks a year in the case of Game Pass, or I think 30 a year for EA Access, and have a library of games, I think that's the future, especially these games that, when they release, are so uh, troubled, like Star Wars Battlefront 2, like Sea of Thieves. Why would I pay $60 when I can pay a subscription fee and, okay, if the games are buggy out of the bat, it, or, you know, if I'm so committed that I want to buy all of the DLC or the gambling stuff that's in these games, um, you know, why should I pay $60? So I, I think that's going to change the perception a little bit. But outside of those two polls, as far as the old stuff and the really new stuff, and we're talking about uh, Saturn, N64, uh, PlayStation, PS2, and all, all those systems, systems with games that, you know, I can put the media in and play them and experience them uh, in their complete form. I think physical is obviously far superior. And I think the only thing that would change is something that, you know, doesn't get a lot of play, but I'm talking about the Saturn, you know, and I love my physical Saturn collection. What happens when the Saturn stops working? You know, I think at that point you're, you you may see uh, a price crash because you know no one can actually play these games. Uh, but you know, again, that's where I think the uh, the clone consoles, hopefully for something like the Saturn, would come in handy. So that will do it for episode two of uh, Q and A. If anyone out there has more questions, I would be more than happy to answer them uh, on a third episode.